What's up, Mandate community? I've got another fantastic episode for you here. We're joined by Dr. Ed Adams, who is the co-author of the book Reinventing Masculinity. Uh, he also wrote, wrote a book before that called Becoming a Happier Men, The Men's Guide to Living a Full and Meaningful Life. Uh, as you could expect by his name, he is also a trained uh, psychologist who operates his own private practice and sees predominantly 95% men. Uh, he's been the past president of Division 51 of the American Psychological Association that focuses on men and masculinity related issues. Uh, but he's also, on top of all of his amazing work with men's work and psychology, he's also a really uh, fantastic and accomplished artist. So in this episode, we're going to get into a lot of really great topics. We cover everything from his journey with psychology into men's work onto how he started uh, his men's organization called Men Mentoring Men or Men 3, what he's learned from that, the difference between group therapy and men's groups. He's got some advice for how to start your own men's group if you are thinking about going and doing that. We talk about what helped him listen to his calling to go and pursue art and really what helped him to also have the courage to then step into it after he heard it. There's so much good stuff to talk about, uh, lots here for you today, but with that, let's go and hang out with Ed. Welcome to The Mandate, a show featuring intimate conversations about men's mental health, masculinity, and identity. We bring you stories to inspire you, experts to guide you, and the tools you need to become the man you truly want to be. It's time to sit back, relax, and open up. Live from The Mandate Studio in Austin, Texas, here's your host, Adam Hoffman. All right, Ed, thank you so much for coming on this mandate with me on this lovely Wednesday afternoon. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine, Adam, and I want to thank you for inviting me to be on your show. I appreciate it. Yeah, I know you and I, we've been going back and forth on scheduling, trying to make it work. You've got a practice that, as you described it, is busier than ever, so I can't tell you how much I appreciate the time to dig into men's stuff with you. Well, you know, if it if men listening or women listening are uh, provoked by what we talk about today and uh, look into things a little deeper, or think a little uh, differently than they did if they weren't listening in, uh, it's totally worth it. And I appreciate your work uh, on that behalf. Well, as somebody who's done so much men's work over the last 30 plus years, I think is what you told me, uh, that means a lot to... Uh, to hear that coming from you. Well, let's let's jump in. And I always like to get started by asking th my guests, like, what has been your journey with your masculinity and mental health? When did when did it start for you? And what does it look like since? Well, um, you know, maybe some people would say my mental health has hasn't started yet. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I've had um, uh, boys and men in my life um, uh, for a very long time. When I finished uh, grade school, I had decided that I wanted to become a Catholic priest. Uh, I mean, what do you know after eighth grade? Uh, but I, I ended up uh, going into the minor seminary, which was all boys and taught by priests and brothers. And uh, I spent two years before I decided uh, that I wanted to leave. But in those two years, I was surrounded by men who were very diverse, um, well-educated, um, uh, creative, artistic, uh, theatrical, um, um, spiritual, um, uh, senses of humor, um, athletic, um, so I, you know, it being in the seminary was was an experience of being around a lot of diverse men, and then I uh, went to college at Xavier University in Cincinnati, which at that time was all male, and a, a Jesuit university, all male, <clears throat> which then put me again around uh, a, a diverse uh, number of men, 
um, uh, in, in the way that they uh, behaved in their masculine skin. And uh, then uh, when I, after I received my doctorate from Rutgers, um, uh, I uh, soon got into private practice and um, I was actually a bit intimidated by strong men, um, sort of uh, 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 anxious about um, their anger or about their frustrations. And, um, and I, I, I had to investigate within myself what was going on there. And, you know, it, it wasn't rocket science, but my, my own dad was a uh, World War II veteran who served on Guadalcanal and also was sent to Europe. So he spent five years uh, of people trying to shoot him. Um, and um, he came back with post-traumatic stress disorder, which was unnamed and untreated uh, back then, <clears throat> uh, except by himself, which was through his alcohol. And so uh, he uh, overused alcohol. He was an alcoholic, um, good provider, loving man, confident man, but a haunted man. I often say that um, neither of us got off the island of Guadalcanal um because it influenced my life so much um but as i was in private practice i realized that um um uh there there were there there was very little going on uh professionally uh either in my training or in actual practice that was focused on men and um i became more and more interested in uh working with men um and um uh, simultaneously more and more interested in shifting my career, not only being a psychologist, but a professional artist. Um, that was a turning point in my life because I wanted to paint and sculpt. And um, what happened was uh, my two partners uh, who were uh, in private practice with me uh, that I brought in, um, couldn't understand why I would want to diminish my private practice to go into a um, sort of a an exile by myself to um, work on the learning curve of learning about um, myself as an artist, which I've always been interested in and as a sculptor. And to make a long story short, we ended up doing a buyout and uh, I found myself without my two best male friends. So uh, I, 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 know, I knew I wanted male company. So I said, well, I think I'll start a men's group. So I started a ther traditional therapy group focused on men. And um, that uh, um, uh, lasted about six months in the traditional sense of me being the psychologist and them being the patient. And I said, you know, something very important is going on here. And it's not the therapy. It's the fact that the men are getting together in a safe environment to be able to talk about important, meaningful things. And so um, because of a traditional perspective of what a psychologist in a group, um, I uh, it became hierarchical. And I, I realized that that hierarchy wouldn't work. So I stopped charging everybody and I stopped um, uh, uh, calling it therapy and I uh, took on more of a coaching model so that I could participate and also uh, stop the hierarchical uh, top-down kind of thing. I mean, so that we were all equals as men. <clears throat> When I began, there were like three or four men at the first group. It began to get bigger and bigger and bigger and, and more and more men were coming in. When we reached a maximum of 15 to 20 men, um, I said, we need to start another group. And so we started another group and that grew to 15 and 20. At that point, I said, you know, we need to go nonprofit. We need to organize this thing. And then eventually it became Men Mentoring Men, which is still in existence today in its 30th year. And <clears throat> Men Mentoring Men uh, now has five groups, ongoing groups, and it's all peer-led. And my job is to 
uh, provide guidance to the group leaders um, in, in that process. Um, simultaneously, uh, I, my art career um, launched. Um, I could, I could uh, boast now that um, Steven Spielberg owns my work. I was commissioned to do a busk of Oscar Schindler that was given to him to thank him for making Schindler's List. I have a 17-foot um, uh, uh, bronze in Parsippany, New Jersey called Courage and Compassion that honors Ryle Wallenberg, who was a Swedish diplomat during the Second War and saved 100,000 people from Eichmann. Um, I was commissioned to do a sculpture honoring uh, people who uh, perished from bad blood products with, with HIV or AIDS. Um, <clears throat> And uh, that's called Prayer Feather. Um, I have a fountain in New Hope, Pennsylvania called the Angel of Hope. Um, and my paintings um, are in many collections and some universities and museums. And, and so it wasn't a hobby. It was, it was a very serious part of my life. And, um, uh, and and so uh, uh, it, it it fed the diversity that I felt I needed inside me, and um, um, and it's been a gift um, because uh, I I preach to men all the time that they have to pay attention to uh, the multitudes inside of them, that they are many that they're not singular dimensions, they're not just providers. They're not just protectors. They're also creators and they're, they're, they're spiritual guides and they are uh, kingly and visionary. They are, um, uh, there's the little boys inside. There are many archetypes inside each man and to pay attention to that. Uh, and men who do tend to live more fulfilled, happier lives. Um, so, uh, now my practice is probably, I'd say, 95% men, and um, um, uh, and uh, I do workshops and I do retreats and I do um, uh, seminars with men um, addressing their masculinity uh, and the way they are in their masculine skin. Um, I have two books. One is um, uh, uh, reinventing masculinity, uh, the, um, uh, and it stresses the idea of the importance of, uh, compassion and connection in our lives, as uh, it's the liberating power of, pa uh, compassion and connection. Uh, and the other one, the first one was becoming a happier man, a man's guide to living a full and meaningful life, which has very little copy but it's all the elements that men have taught me that are present or that they're working on when they express themselves as being happier. And it's illustrated with my art. It's a I long mean, answer to your question. <laughs> well, I appreciate it because it's such an amazing and diverse career. And I have to imagine there's a lot of good stories within. So I think we can kind of use that as our, our place to go and unpack it and, We'll spend a little bit of time on the book. I'll just say say now, thanks for writing it. Uh, it was one that really spoke to me and through meeting you and meeting the other Ed, uh, it's just opened up a lot of doors and really great conversations that have helped kind of guide me on my, my journey to figure out how can I contribute to this movement that seems to get uh, picked up and restarted and revitalized every every so often, um, but nonetheless keeps keeps trudging forward. So I want to go back to something that you said to me in our first conversation, where you you really wanted to be an artist, but then you decided to go get into psychology. And I think unlike a lot of people that have those, uh, I don't know, non traditional, if you will, desires and pulls in their life, you actually made it back full circle well to, w somewhat full circle but you at least came back to it mm -hmm. um was there anything when you think about deciding to go and pursue art and not necessarily put your career on pause but make space for both things what helped you step into that mm. well uh what helped me step into that 
was very personal. Um, uh, I have to tell you, Adam, that that when I made that decision that I wanted to pursue the art along with the psychology, and the psychology was in place, um, it was it wasn't a. I look back at that, and it wasn't as though it was a thought. It was as though somebody had grabbed me by the earlobes and said, "You have to move in this direction." It be it was so compelling. And I kept, I kept saying, uh, but I have a learning curve. It's like, um, and it started, it started with, um, um, uh, uh, you know, it started long ago, but um, the day after I defended my dissertation, I was doing sculpture. And um, uh, it was um, um, it just, just like uh, adding, adding, uh, coal to the fire. It was just, it was, the desire was, was so strong. And I had no, I had no goals. I had no, no um, particular idea where this was going to go or whether it was, I wasn't thinking of it economically. I wasn't thinking. And uh, uh, a lot of people thought I was just uh, going crazy. You know, it's like, why would you give up the psychology uh, or compromise the side. I wasn't giving it up in order to do the art. And that included my ex-wife who said I didn't expect to be married to Van Gogh. Um, and uh, my some some of my then friends who thought that I was being uh, very self-consumed, which I probably was, but um, uh, I was, uh, my argument was, this is making me happy. <laughs> you know, it's a, and it's a damn good argument, you know, uh, and, and, um, but what happened was I spent about three years by myself after a divorce and I practiced what I preached, which was to um, not jump off and find somebody to fill the void. So um, I, I worked at my art. I, I, I started to show, I started to, um, uh, have exhibits. I started to get press. I started to, um, and I live. I live. I live in in the Bucks County area of New Jersey, which is an art scene unto itself, and and a, and a full history of Bucks County arts. So I uh, uh, moved here because I would be surrounded by uh, writers and and uh, artists and craftspeople and. Um, uh, sculptors, but mostly uh, visual artists. Um, and so I hooked into the community of, of artists, which enriched my life enormously. And then people started coming into my world and not knowing whether I was a psychologist or artist. Uh, my first date with my wife, we've been married over 20 years, um, she lived in Washington, D.C., and uh, she purchased a piece of my sculpture on my first date with her. And so how many guys can boast that they made money on their first date? You know? How special <laughs> is that, man? <laughs> right. Uh, she now brags that she owns a lot from that one investment. <laughs> um, Positive ROI on that one. Right. <laughs> That's right. Um, so uh, I, th I think what inspired me was, was the internal desire and I listened to it. A lot of men hear a calling or they hear a voice that moves them in a direction. And if you're lucky, you're hearing that. If you're unlucky, you don't listen to it. Yeah, because I mean, that, that, was the, that was the part that I wanted to, to really dig into as you said that you heard it. And I was gonna say the exact same thing, like for so many, I know even for myself, I'm, I'm still not to the point yet where I can discern between the first time that I hear something, should I pay attention to it? It's kind of like you got to hear it a couple times. So hearing is one skill that if you can get, I, I'd like to think that you can get better at it and that increases your luckiness. And then the second part that I'm interested in, what worked for you was once you hear it, how did you find the courage or the guts or whatever you want to call it to say, yeah, I'm going to go and give it a shot? Well, 
I, I think there are a lot of individual differences with that, but um, I, I am typically um, willing to take calculated risks. And, um, and, uh, and that has demonstrated itself uh, in many ways throughout my, my, my life. But um, I think men, and I, and I certainly, it, it was true for me, I, I realized I reached a crossroad. And that crossroad was, do I want to be safe or do I want to be open up the possibility of greater happiness? And safety is very compelling. Um, but I, 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 I went the other way. I took the other road. Um, I am at a point in my life now where I have a lot of hindsight with that. And I am extremely grateful that I did that. Um, it made, um, I, I think had I not made that, I would be uh, probably um, a lot wealthier than I am, or I would, uh, um, I, I would have lived a different life. But I, 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 I think that what drives a lot of men and women into therapy are, you know, we often say depression or anxiety or life transitions. I often say what drives people into therapy is the consequence of not living unlived lives. You know, uh, whether that's in my case, uh, 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 expressing myself through the arts, um, but it could be, I want, I have a bad relationship with my children. I want to know the world. I want to live a life with a good one. I, I, have a, I don't know intimacy and I want to live a life with intimacy. Um, I, I, I'm in a career that is, is, as one man said, I'm getting better and better at doing something I hate, you know, which is, is a, is a um, sort of a, a sentence of a total tragedy, you know? Yeah. And, 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 but his unlived life is doing something that he loves. Um, which for, in his case, he wanted to be a nurse instead of a salesman. And, and that's one of the stories that's in the book, right? Uh, yeah. 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 That was a great one. Yeah. That was a really, really great one. So the, the other part that stood out to me, uh, on your journey of deciding and leaning into your art and your professional work that also, I'm going to assume the professional work brings you some amount of uh, joy and reward as well when you're when you're doing it. Otherwise, you still wouldn't be doing it. You're that kind of a oh, guy. Absolutely, profoundly, yeah. But the other part yeah. of it was the importance of community and and how that helped you step mm -hmm. into these spaces. You moved to a place that so you could surround yourself with people that were doing the work. You created your men's group and men mentoring men so that you could be surrounded by people that wanted to go and do the work. Am I? Am I pointing at two things that are coincidence, or is that something that you have found to be important throughout your life? Well, um, I, it, it wasn't necessarily conscious because I had always considered myself not particularly a joiner, but uh, more of a creator. That's the centerpiece of my life is creating, uh, just as we're doing right now. We're, we didn't rehearse this. This is an improvisation, what you and I are doing right now. Um, and uh, but uh, it led me to also to um, rejoin the American Psychological Association. And I found Division 51 of that, which is focused on um, the study of, of uh, boys and men. And um, uh, when I went to my first event there, uh, I was surrounded by uh, many men and some women who focus on men. And all of a sudden I realized uh, what I was creating with Men Mentoring Men, the nonprofit, and what I was doing in therapy, that there were other people doing that too. And, and, and I felt connected to that immediately. Uh, eventually became president of the division and now past president, uh, but still very involved. So I, I think your point of the art community, the psychology community, or just the community, uh, like uh, people we hang, my wife and I hang out with, uh, uh, that support love or 
connection or marriage or, or playfulness uh, is vitally important uh, to, um, to uh, broaden yourself, to uh, connect yourself, to uh, have a place to belong, places to belong, not a place, but places to belong, um, and to contribute, okay? to, to contribute. That's, 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 that's perhaps as important, if not more important than belonging. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's like that belonging gives you all the ingredients that you need to then start to contribute, um, because you're less trying to just survive by being not alone, you know, okay, great. I've got that. I've got my need for belonging taken care of. Now I have uh, I have the space and the possibilities now to to go and create and to contribute in a meaningful way. Can you talk a little bit about what was the what was it like creating Division Fifty One, and you know why did you want to do it, and what came of it? Um, you mean with the American Psychological Association? Or, yeah. Or or yeah. Um, well, that existed before I I. Um, uh, I, I entered into it. It, it, it was pre-existing. But what I found was that um, I found it very validating because everything I was doing, like inventing on my own, was either ahead of the curve or there were other men struggling to help other men in much the same way. Um, and so um, uh, I found that... Um, if I got involved and when when I ran for the presidency, uh, my agenda was to um, introduce or reintroduce uh, ways in which men can accept compassion as a masculine trait. So it gave me a form. Um, and it was right around the time that uh, the division came out with its guidelines for the treatment of men and boys. Uh, this is going back a few years, uh, which attracted a lot of attention and much of uh, uh, criticism, particularly from um, sort of the right political wing that was saying that we're trying to feminize men and so on and and trying to, you know, uh, and so it, 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 it landed me on the Laura Ingram show and uh, also on Good Morning America with Michael Strahan. Uh, to talk about uh, something that I I, I I I don't like the phraseology, but to talk about toxic masculinity, which I try to debunk, um, and um, and uh, to def uh, kind of uh, explain, not defend, but explain the guidelines, which um, are. I, 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 to this day, I can't imagine people having arguments against the guidelines because it was things like um, um, uh, teaching greater acceptance, becoming more involved as fathers, um, uh, teaching men to uh, and modeling a greater expression of, of, of feelings and so on. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, all the things about <clears throat> releasing men to become more, more fully human. Uh, I mean, how can you be against that? You know, and, and, <laughs> you know, um, and um, it 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 never said don't be strong or competent or stop being providers and protectors. It was just expanding all of those roles, and so I was really happy to uh, be in a position where I could have not just a local but a more of a national influence, uh, a, a voice that. Um, uh, that that a lot of people could hear, um, uh, because I believe in the message, and I believe in I believe in the change, I believe in the reinvention of masculinity in terms of including uh, a greater awareness of connection and certainly self compassion and compassion. Yeah, how how do you argue with those those things? I I I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> Not effectively, anyway. I mean, uh, the, you know, the the usual arguments are, um, uh, like I said, that somehow we're turning men in. Uh, somebody on the internet referred to me as a wuss, you know, and um, nothing can be more 
uh, manly or strong or courageous than act being compassionate because to be compassionate, you actually have to confront and acknowledge suffering either in yourself or in others. So I, I, I lived through the Vietnam era and every night on TV, uh, the reporters were on the front lines. We were watching people die. We were watching people, um, uh, uh, our own men, and uh, as well as others, uh, get wounded, uh, get harmed. Uh, and then if you uh, look at the TV of the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the Afghanistan or um, the Iraq war, um, it, it became more of a computer game and uh, the, a target would be seen and then you'd see a puff. You never saw the suffering that was going on. And a part of why that Vietnam War ended was because watching the suffering evoked compassion in people. Not seeing that compassion makes you indifferent. Not seeing the suffering makes you indifferent. Or worse yet, um, harm uh, that that the pain is harmless yeah um, I'm, I'm glad it, you called that out it it reminds me of talk actually talking about that in history class and i don't know if it's common to talk about that why that was so important with the vietnam war but now i've now i've got some gratitude and hindsight for my high school history teacher for placing some importance and calling that out why that made such a big difference and it's something that's now it, you're, you're reminding me that it's come up for me in the last the last year is being able to put faces and events and make that stuff more public, whether it comes to gender inequality, racial inequality, um, all that stuff. Like you can, we see what's happening and that makes it so much more, yeah, it makes it so much more salient to us that you have to experience that suffering. Now, sure, you can turn it off uh, or at least try to, but chances are these days, you'd literally have to turn everything off to get away from it. That's correct, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even George Floyd uh, is an example of, of being able to see his suffering and his, uh, his unfortunate death. And um, it, if we didn't see it, if somebody just told you that story, it would be, oh, I'm sorry that happened. But watching the film, uh, over and over again, it's like you see not only him suffering, but you know you could also have compassion for the police. You know, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, and and uh, because you could see their suffering, and um, it doesn't forgive what happened, but it does uh, it does connect you humanly. And, and one thing men are pretty estranged from is the notion of self-compassion, seeing the compassion within yourself and then doing something to either relieve or prevent that suffering. Men often uh, like uh, will grin and bear it, you know, or be mm. stoic. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's 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 one of those paradoxes that I think is really fascinating is that men, as men, we're so fast to want to fix things, want to be the the savior or the hero come in and do it. But when it comes to doing it for ourselves, it's like, oh, no, 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 like not going to take care of that. But your problems, I all day, I'll be, I'll be there for your problems all day, but not my own. Right. Right. Yeah. I'll drive you to the doctor, but I won't see one, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's a good uh, segue to where I wanted to go next. And that's the part of your journey where you create, the first version of your men's group and then evolve it. What I wanted to ask is what are some of the differences between a therapy group and a men's group? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, men mentoring men, for example, uh, says over and over again that it's not intended to be therapy. It's therapeutic therapy. Therapy means helpful. Um, and it attracts men who are interested in living richer, deeper, more intimate, connected lives with themselves and others. Um, and uh, if a man presents himself with, uh, with a too serious of a psychological problem, he will be referred for therapy prior to uh, coming into men mentoring men. Um, 
it's it's uh, you know we all have problems we all have issues um, uh, and and uh, but the idea of men mentoring men is for to create a safe environment and how we make it safe is by having one rule and that is no man shames another man and uh, once a man knows he's not going to be shamed for for his thoughts or his actions um it's going to be held up you know to to some some uh, uh questioning and standards uh it's not carte blanche here but but um uh, he's not going to be shamed i you know all the years i've been in practice and all the things i've heard from men and women i have not heard one thing somebody has done that i'm not capable of I've 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 heard things I certainly don't want to do or choose not to do or or find it unethical to do or immoral to do and so on and so forth. But um, I can't I can't stand back and say, oh, I I'm incapable of doing that. And so that by knowing that about yourself, it 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 it, it allow it allows uh, empathy and then potentially compassion to come in for others. Because it creates suffering, and you know, uh, um, so the difference between the two is the the um, um, uh, is, is sometimes blurred. But uh, when 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 I see men in therapy, we're we're going we're taking a deep dive vertically. You know, in in men mentoring men, the social aspect of it, the interconnected aspect of it, is very very important. <clears throat> and um, we not only have groups, but uh, we've evolved to have activities. For example, we're going to be having a retreat in September, hopefully, if things are okay. Uh, and we usually have an annual retreat. We have an annual wilderness experience. We have a annual you don't need talent talent show um, uh, where men are asked to do something uh, take a risk, you know, read your poetry, uh, sing a song, tell a joke, um, uh, play an instrument. Uh, we had one man who had recently been divorced and uh, he had very little money, but he said, I had enough money to buy a cello or a TV. And I always wanted to learn the cello. So he bought a, an inexpensive cello and he started to teach himself on the internet. And so the You Don't Need Talent talent show came up and he brought his cello and he played um, somewhat poorly, but he played Mary Had a Little Lamb on the cello. And uh, it's, it's become, he got a standing ovation and uh, it's become legend in Men Mentoring Men, not because of, of the song, but because of the courage um and and the 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 model that that created for the other men it's like just let it rip guys you know just let it rip yeah i love that do you have any advice for somebody a guy who might be watching this and say man i could really use that community of men i want to go start my own men's group like how would they get started doing that yeah well uh, that's a, a, a excellent question, and we are getting that more uh, that that question more. I would suggest that what men do is um, uh, invite, do some reading about, uh, read the book. That, that the, the book itself actually both of my books. I'm, I'm not boasting here, but uh, the 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 both of the books can be curriculums. So that can provide structure and the structure for um, sitting down and having uh, meaningful conversations with two other men um, and then invite other men to in, uh, enter that conversation. And um, uh, it doesn't need to have a psychologist or some mental health professional running it. Um, it's, it's, but it does need to be a safe place. And um, and you need to be aware that men are used to uh, putting each other down. Oh, I can't believe you think that. Or, um, well, that's stupid. Um, it's like, well, 
how did you expect that to work? You know, those are the kinds of statements that um, will shut anybody down. Um, and so if, if you're interested in, in starting a men's group, and I encourage men to do this, um, you have to have a certain amount of awareness and sensitivity, um, uh, some good emotional intelligence uh, about others. Um, and um, uh, you could get in touch with um, me, you could get in touch with uh, people in, you could look in your community and see if there's anybody running a men's group. Um, uh, you could, um, uh, you could do it on a weekly basis. You could do it on a monthly basis. You could, you could have um, a day uh, that men get together and, and, and create it together as a community. It's like, okay, we, let's start a men's group. How the, how the hell do we do this? Let's figure it out. You know, like what's important to us? Uh, men can invent their own group uh, as a community. I like so, that co-creation co idea. Yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah. Well, I know we are, we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, I want to <clears throat> ask you about something that you said to me the first time that we talked, and it was a quote that I wrote down. You said, men forget to play. And I thought that might be a nice thing to talk about for us to, to end on is like, how can men embrace more play and wh what does that really mean? Yeah, well, that's, um, that's an important point. Um, uh, men forget that life is absurd. You know, there's an absurdity about life, that we live in contradiction, that we live in, in a world that is both incredibly beautiful and incredibly bizarre and that our brains have not evolved to perfection uh, if they did we wouldn't be building bombs that could destroy uh, the planet a, a thousand times over so there's a certain in, in, in insanity that we we all have inher inherited and so what is play play is the ability to um, to laugh it's the ability to um, uh, enjoy the absurdity of life. It's the ability to uh, challenge oneself, uh, to um, provide an opportunity for yourself to explore things that um, you haven't explored before, but not taking it so seriously, like afraid of failure, afraid of, of trying, afraid of what other people would think. Uh, uh, when you were a child, uh, I know when I was a little boy, and 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 this is true of of almost all boys, uh, you, you don't you don't you don't call somebody to come out and play, and and then start worrying what are they going to think, or what if I do it wrong, you know. Um, there's a cute story where a, a man was going to he was a professor of art. And his daughter asked him, uh, where are you going, daddy? He said, I'm going to work. He said, what, daddy, what do you do for work? He says, I teach people how to draw. And she was baffled. She said, when did they forget? <laughs> you know, and, and so we forget, we forget about play. We forget about creativity. Um, it's about going into the new. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and, and, uh, you know, there's nothing healthier than a, a belly laugh, you know, and, um, uh, I, and I see so few men do that. Yeah. It, it, there's, 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 it, there's a sadness about that. Mm -hmm. you know? It's a, what just came into my mind is, uh, the Joker and his, his classic line of why so serious Batman? Right, right, exactly. <clears throat> Why so serious? Yeah. Um, so uh, um, being able to understand that you are designed to play, and then you know it changes. I mean, you're not going to play like you did when you were eight, when when you're uh, 35, 45. Um, but um, taking a walk can be a form of play. Um, uh, learning how to fly fish is a form of play um uh you know reading a book can be a form of play but um uh for men 
uh, I think it's very important to include the social aspect of being with others in a playful way. Because, uh, um, and being with playful people, you know, being, being with people who know how to play or, or are willing to do that. You may have just inspired me to go start a summer camp just to teach men, to reteach men how to play. Like, and I know that there's a lot of people that do, you know, retreats and stuff like that. I, I think it's great. But like, if the sole intent is like, remember how to play again, I was just thinking about, like you just said, you know, you might not play like you did when you were eight. What if you did, right? Like, what if there was a place that you could go to to really reignite at an absurd level, that sense right. of play of like, just going for it and do it swinging from that tree. You don't know how deep that water is um, right. or r- running over that hill. Who knows what's, who knows what's back there in those woods. And just like you said, just going for it. Right. That's what the, uh, you don't need talent talent show is. It's, it's, it's like, don't take yourself seriously. Just play. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. awesome. Well, I, I, you may have just said, the the best parting thought but i always end our mandates with uh one last thought for our viewers and our listeners to to have them take away what would you like to leave people with Uh, um uh, if, if you're a man appreciate your manhood and understand that there is no such thing as masculinity there are only masculinities there are many ways of being a man uh, many ways of expressing yourself, but um, don't hold yourself back from uh, being loving and affectionate uh, or strong or competent or capable. Uh, don't be afraid of achievement. Don't be afraid of tenderness. Um, l- uh, let your humanity rip. Let your humanity rip. Ooh, that is a good ending line. Well, for everybody that's uh, that's watching this or listening, I'll make sure to put this link in the show notes too. But if you don't have the book, you have to go and read it. It is fantastic. Reinventing Masculinity. That's the website. It's everywhere. Book, book paper copy, digital copy, whatever you want. You can go and find it. Um, as Ed mentioned earlier, there's some great stories in it. There's some really good practical stuff that you can start applying right away. And for me, it was just a ton of really helpful reframe. So Thank you uh, for writing the book. Thank you for being here for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Adam. And thank you for having uh, the show. It's, it's extremely helpful to a lot of people. We got, we got some work to do, but I'm glad to be stepping into the space uh, with you and following your footsteps. And hopefully we can continue to build on it together. I, I, I would love that. All right. Well, thanks again for being here. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll, we'll talk here soon. All right, Adam, take good care of yourself. Thanks for listening to The Mandate with your host, Adam Hoffman. It's time to do your part in raising awareness of men's mental health, shifting the stigma, and having a positive impact on someone's life. Share this episode with a friend who could use some support and post it on your social channels. Have questions or thoughts? Text Adam at 512-980-3935. Find more episodes, upcoming live shows, and life-changing resources at MandateShow.com. Your mandate is to take your mental health seriously. Be courageous. Stay vulnerable. Live authentically. Until next time, y'all.